Welcome to the Global Prayer Network, with Rev. Dr. Seth O. Lardy. We pray this teaching will impact your life, and bring you closer in your walk with Jesus. Let's get ready to receive today's teaching from, Rev. Dr. Seth O. Lardy. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father in heaven, we thank you even right now, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy. Thank you for blessing us with the gift of life. We thank you for mothers. We thank you for fathers. We thank you for the family. Lord God, bless us now and cause us each to be a blessing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Praise God. Friday, before we left uh, the session, there was a question posed to us from uh, the Reverend Donna Marie. The question had to do with the role of the church in equipping young parents. I believe that was one that uh, Brother Smith had asked. And then Reverend Marie came back to ask the question about religious education released time program, religious education released time program. That I believe is one of the ways that the church can participate in helping young parents and even young people to make wise decisions and to construct their lives in a manner that will bring honor and glory to God. What is the Religious Education Released Time Program? Back in 1956, somewhere thereabout, the Supreme Court of the United States passed a law that a local church with the permission of the parents of those students could go and can go to a local school, take the children from the local school during the course of the day, take them over to the church and teach them religious education. That is available to parents. How do we come to know that particular law? It was when the either the National Council of Churches or World Council of Churches, one of the two, had their 50th anniversary and we attended that particular event. And the event was upstairs and the restrooms in that particular hall were downstairs. And I needed to use the restroom. I was on my way to the restroom when I passed by a door and I saw the people in that particular room. They were so passionate. They were, I mean, they were animated. And I said, what's going on up in here? Let me stop and look and see. I went in. And what were they talking about? They were talking about the religious education release time program. I sat there and I listened and I listened and I listened. And the more I listened, the more I saw that as one of the ways that we could help public education to groom and to uh, give character education to our young people. And I came back from that particular meeting 
and I made an appointment to go meet our superintendent at the time. And when I said, Mr. Superintendent, I believe we have the answer to a lot of what is happening in the public schools because typically human beings are spirit, soul, and body. And uh, what happens in the educational arena, you know, meets the need of the soul and the body, but not the spirit. I said, here, yeah, I believe, is the answer. He said, what? I said, there is a program called the Religious Education Release Time Program. It's a program that a church can initiate that when you have the permission of the parents with the concurrence of the principal and other members of the school, you can take the children to the church and teach them about God and take them back to the school. It's not an after-school program. It is actually a program that occurs during the course of the day. And he looked at me as though I had misplaced my mind. He said, well, that is a program that we already honor. I said, what do you mean we honor that program? He said, well, we allow uh, the Muslims to leave school on Fridays and go to the mosque and pray and come back. I said, but why no one told us Protestants and Christians about it? Anyway, we now knew how to get it done. And we went to work. And Reverend Marie asked about it because she was a part of it. We saw some marvelous transformation in the life of the children. We used to have it at the church. And I recall the first time we went and picked up those young people and, and brought them to the church. They literally walked on the kneeling rail. You know, when you come to church where you kneel down to pray, the children came in and they walked on that rail on their way to their seats. We didn't, you know, get all bent out of ship and, uh, you know, why you're doing that, etc. We didn't do that because we knew that they did it because they didn't know any better. So they would come in, they would sit down and, you know, we'd teach them the word of God and give them a little lunch, get them back on the bus and take them back to the school. We saw so many transformative events. The same children who used to walk on the rail, the kneeling rail on their way to their seats, those same children would come in, kneel down and pray before they went to their seats. The same children who, as a matter of fact, the school that we worked with was the school in the entire system that after you've been suspended, after you've been reprimanded, after you've been whatever, that was your last chance if you're going to remain in the school system. That was the school that we're working with. And we saw those children go from the big old hair that they will pick out an afro to where they were brushing their hairs because they had cut it off. Children who were wearing their pants almost to their knees. We saw them wearing belt. As a matter of fact, some of them started wearing tie to, to class. And I said, I asked one, one dad, I said, why are you wearing tie to, to school? He said, because I'm the star of the class. I said, what do you mean you're the star of the class? He said, well, you know, um, my behavior, my academics, 
I mean, just my basic character has so improved that I've been given the title of star of the class. I said, wonderful. Because of those children, we were able to abort, maybe give or take 10, 15, 20 plus fights that were going to take place at the school. When they would come on Friday, they would tell us, you know, a fight is about to take place at the school today. And then we'll do what? We'll call the school and tell them, listen, <laughs> there's a fight about to occur. You all get ready. And then they will call all of the SRO, these, uh, you know, people who gave supervision from the police department uh, at the school, sheriff department, et cetera. And they will quench those uh, fights. One of the most amazing things was when we had one of the graduation programs at another church, uh, the CME church, had a very good friend. His name was uh, Reverend Dr. at the time, Bobby Best, who became a bishop in the CME church. He has gone since to be with the Lord. But at his church, we had a graduation. And if I'm not mistaken, either nine or 19 or so young girls not only gave their life to Christ, but vowed to remain virgins until they got married. That is how impactful the program was on the life of those children. There was another little boy that I remember so vividly. Uh, him and his mother just couldn't set horses. I mean, him and his mother will always be in fights. And so one day in a class, we asked him, son, what, what, what's going on? And he shared how his mother will not want him to go over to play. She would not want him to go out at night. And on and on. And so we asked him, he said, well, uh, Where's your father? Where's your father? And he said his father was in prison. So, okay. Do you know that what's really happening? Your mother does not want you to end up in prison just like your daddy. She's not being difficult with you. But if you're out at night, if you're in places that bad things are happening, there's a high probability you could easily end up in prison just like your daddy, and she didn't want that. And it was like the light bulb went off in his mind. Because at that time, we're teaching from the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother. And the light bulb went off in his mind, and he realized, oh, okay. And that was the moment of transformation, relational transformation between him and his mother. He was changed. It was because of that religious education, religious time program. Several states have it on their books to permit such, but because there is not a conversation about it, you don't hear much about it. Uh, by the grace of God, we are about to resurrect that particular program in Forsyth County, where we reside. And uh, by the grace of God, we're going to perfect that in Forsyth County, and then we'll take it to the rest of the 99 counties in North Carolina. And then after we get through with all of North Carolina, we'll go to the different states and hopefully, prayerfully, by the grace of God, this is going to become a national program. It's already national, just that we're going to make it practical and available to young people in the schools again. And uh, we think, particularly for us, it's a very meaningful program. You see, most of the other nationalities 
If you notice, they build these educational buildings on their school, on their church properties. And what do they do is that after school, they take the children and they go and continue to teach them. You know, the Jewish people and other nationalities. Unfortunately for us, uh, we build a church, we build a fellowship hall, and to be used for weddings and funerals and other kinds of occasions. And we have these realists sitting out there doing nothing all week long. But the program, Religious Education Release Time Program, is one that can really, really bring about a change in our communities. Because as Paul said, we are spirit, we are soul, and we are body. We've done a good job of taking care of the physical, that's the body, but we haven't done a good job taking care of the soul and the spirit. And that's because when it comes to the spirit, it is the word of God that can make the difference. And so we think that uh, religious education release time program is what it is going to take to bring about a transformative culture, character in the life of our children. So yes, to the question that uh, Reverend Marie asked, Religious Education Release Time Program has the capability, capacity, and the influence to transform the life of our children. And uh, that's another way that we can protect our children from hurt, harm, and danger. So I'm gonna stop there. If there's any question on that, you may put it to me and I'll seek to answer. If not, then we're gonna go on with our lesson for today. Any question on the Religious Education Release Time Program? Okay. Okay, Bishop. Yes. Good, good afternoon. Is that program available in the state of Georgia? Um, that's a good question. Um, let me let me check on that, uh, sister, and get back with you. Uh, I, I'm almost sure. I'm almost sure that it is. But let us check on that and get back with you. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, well, because. I could Google, mm -hmm. But perhaps I could Google and find out too. Yes, you can do I, that. You can do I, that. I you can do it. Just just Google. Uh, is religious education release time program permissible in in Georgia in the school system? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. We'll do it and make sure you do the same. Uh, because here again, and if you should choose to do it, let us know, and we'll share with you some of the particularities that will make it successful. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. For example, uh, you have to be able to do it within an hour's time. Mm -hmm. You know, and that means you must do it in a, a, a between the church and the school that are in close proximity. That it won't take more than five, ten minutes to get them from the church to the school, vice versa. Right. Uh, yeah, that's one of the particularities. The other thing about it, too, is that you cannot use anything uh, relating to or owned by the school system. Right. For example, when it comes to transportation, et cetera, it all has to be the church. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So when, 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 when we find out and you want to do it, just let us know. We'll walk you through as to what makes the program successful. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. That program, I guarantee you, can turn communities around. Uh, it has the ability. Yeah. Anyone else before we move on? 
Okay. Here in none, today we want to talk about the importance of creating an environment for children to grow and to develop in what God created them, created them to be. Creating an environment for children to be able to grow and to develop in what God wants them to be. When we were in Western West Africa, we visited, we had some like 408 churches. We visited all of them to see what was going on. And one of the things that we noticed, we noticed these very beautifully drawn, designed images of Jesus Christ. And some of these pictures were right over the, 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 the altar where you couldn't help but to see it. And uh, whenever we saw those, we encouraged the pastor and the leadership to take them down. And we said to them, the word of God said, you should not create any image or any likeness of God. You know, some of us on this call right now, if I was to ask you to close your eyes and tell me the color of Jesus, I guarantee you, most of us on this platform right now will come back with the answer that, that Jesus looks pale, white. Why? Because the images, the likeness, the forms, that we've seen down through the years, they do not give any impression that Jesus is color like us. And let me tell you some of the uh, negatives because of that disobedience. You know, we hear sometimes people say, well, some of us think that, you know, poor choice of words, but that's what we say, that the white man's water is cooler than the black man's water, even though the water have all come out of the same general electric refrigerator. Because our minds have been programmed into thinking that, if it is black, it must not be right. But if it is white, it must be right. Unfortunately. And so, for example, a white doctor can, in his lifetime of practice, make several mistakes. And sometimes people die. But we still go back to them. But let that be a black doctor. The very first mistake that that doctor makes and gives you the wrong cough medicine, you start telling everybody in the community. Because we've learned that if it is black, it is not what it ought to be. But listen to this, though. Listen to this. I'm not sure whether we pay attention sometimes. Why is it that any kind of a formal, dignified event, they want to wear black suits? Why? 
Why is it that most of the elegant cars, limousines used by the presidents and others, they're black? Why is it that the Friday after uh, 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 Thanksgiving, when uh, the commercial world in America actually turns up the heat about sales, it's called Black Friday. Even though Black Friday meant something else, but they have they have they have spun that phrase to mean more of profitability. You know, Black Friday, way historically, was called Black Friday because it was when slaves were brought out to be auctioned to be sold. That's where Black Friday came from. But in today's vernacular, Black Friday is more of a time when, you know, people rush to the stores four o'clock in the morning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What am I saying to you? Images, words, symbols, can have a profound impact on children. What, what is the environment like in your house when it comes to your children? You know, you're saying one thing, but then they're so uh, impacted by what they see. You know, I remember many, many years ago visiting some of our wonderful church people and they would have in their homes statue of the Buddha. And I would say to myself, I wonder if they know what they are saying and doing. And so we have all of these symbols, sororities and fraternities, and I guarantee you, for many of us, you go to any black campus, if you say Skiwi, what sorority comes to your mind? Anybody, if you know. All right. Uh, AKA. All right, AKA. If you went to a campus and you started saying, who, who, who? What comes to mind? A monkey. The what now? A monkey. A monkey. <laughs> I got you. Uh, anyone else will help us when you go to a black college campus and you hear then who? Who, you know, that's Omega Psi Psi, the Q dogs. That's Omega Psi Phi Q dog. I mean, anywhere, you know, to do different kind of symbols, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because it's been etched in the mind. It's been etched in the mind. And, you know, I have to, I have to give it to the people who have been able to formulate and create those sororities and fraternities. Because guess what? The sororities and the fraternities, they have a bond of friendship that I do not see in the church. And I'm still trying to find out what in the world that they do with each other that caused them to be so kind, gracious to each other. I remember once upon a time, Mrs. Lati and I were traveling, coming from one state to the other. And we stopped at one of these rest stops in America to have these rest stops where you stop to buy something to refresh yourself, etc. And she was going toward the building 
came out a young lady wearing the colors of AKA. And those two started talking as though they had known each other for rock of ages. I've seen it over and over with the fraternities, the sororities, even those in the lodge. And I'm trying to understand why can't we have a similar kind of friendship, love between us in the life of the church? But that's another question for another time. Today, we want to begin to lay the foundation of how we save our homes and save our children and save our families for God is the kind of environment that we create. What are the kind of symbols and the images and the sounds and the tones that you have in your home? They can be positive, they can be negative. If we want to save our children, if we want them to grow in an environment that looks like what God wants them to become, then the images, the symbols, the sounds, the verbiage, the activities in the home, we must pay close attention to them. And we're going to continue on tomorrow talking about creating an environment, creating an ambience, creating a place where our children can grow up in the ways God wants them to be. In Jesus' name, amen.